Thank you, Mike. I met our speaker in 2009, and he and I actually uh, sort of team taught or team did the uh, interim pastorate at the Free Church in Hemet, California. And since then, he and I have worked together officially and unofficially, and I consider him a great colleague in ministry. He's been the head of a denomination. He's been uh, his last professional gig was with the Evangelical Free Church of America West District as the placement. He's been involved in uh, with over a thousand churches, and he's helped place uh, f over 400 senior pastors in the Pastor Next process. So he has a, a wealth of experience. Graduate, uh, we won't hold this against him of Biola and Talbot, right? Is that? And Western, and then uh, there's a few. There's a few fans out there. But anyway, uh, we're going We're beginning uh, the process with Dennis. Uh, he and I have been working together, or looking for Pastor Next. So the search process has been going on, and now will, is officially public. And tonight you'll meet the search committee as well as we have time to meet and greet with Dennis at greater length uh, to understand the search process. But Dr. Dennis Baker, God bless you, and uh, welcome to Trinity Church. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dave, for that very, very kind introduction. <clears throat> I've often wondered what my mother would have thought had she ever heard that. Like some of you, um, I'm educated well beyond my intelligence, 23 years of school, I miss kindergarten, and mostly untouched by education. I come from a non-church, non-Christian background in Oregon, which is going to be part of my story today and some of the illustrations. And here am I, by the grace of God, as you are, but how in the world does a kid who was not raised in a church or in the faith become the church guy? Not the church lady, the church guy. It is only by the grace of God, <clears throat> and more on that later. I have known Trinity Church for a long time. I knew some of your founding members back when. Your first pastor, Chuck Miller, was a casual professional colleague, and some of you can probably do too pro-apt in your Bible study disciplines even to this day. And if you don't know what that means, you need to find out somewhere along the journey. The theme for today is a 21st century church with a first century power, and how do we know the God of power in a season of transition? It's my conviction, not only that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Philippians, but that the church at Philippi was itself like Trinity of Redlands, a church in transition. Perhaps you read the connections that I picked up last week as I moved among you. I spent the entire last Sunday here. I was the guy walking around with a baseball cap and the long ponytail. Perhaps, <coughs> perhaps you saw me. Bill Bjorn, <coughs> Bill Born, not Bjorn, that's another Swede, through prayer and conversation, Trinity Church leadership has boldly chosen the following central ministry focus for our next chapter together, empowering believers to reach their world for Christ. Thus, in the spirit of that theme of the church <clears throat> and for a church in transition, we look this morning at some of Paul's letter to this church at Philippi. We'll call it Trinity Church at Philippi just to make things easy this morning. It does not take a New Testament scholar to read through the book of Acts, as you can see in your study notes in your worship folder. When you read through this upper story purpose that flows through the book of Acts, you you and I are captivated and amazed at the power of the gospel and how lives were changed, cities and regions and cultural zones were impacted. In Acts chapter 16, <clears throat> that story is unfolded of what is the first church of record on European soil. 
And their powerful waves of God's life-transforming grace swept through this community, a community not unlike the Inland Empire and Greater Redlands. This was a church that was filled with remarkable diversity, socioeconomic, socio-demographic diversity. There were people from different language groups, different cultural groups, different viewpoints in this little place called Philippi, which was out at the extremity of the Roman Empire. It was at the end of the Roman freeway system, which was part of how they maintained, the Romans maintained what was called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. And the Roman leadership, what they did <clears throat> was they took many of their retired military people and they billeted them out there to get them out of their hair. So Paul, in his letter to the church at Philippi, uses many military metaphors as well as his usual um, uh, inputs from the local uh, sports page. This last week, I was reminded of a great quote attributed to Mark Twain. Mark Twain said a lot of very funny and great things, and probably a lot of things were said that he didn't say. But, and pardon me while I, as I shared with Mike before the first service, two years ago I got a virus in my vocal cords, and periodically this comes back to haunt me, so I may have to take a nip, little nip at the water. Um, Costco, <clears throat> Kirkland, Mark Twain said this, everybody wants to serve God in an advisory capacity. <laughs> everybody wants to serve God in an advisory capacity. And I don't know about you, but I've had to continually go through a discipline of resigning as first officer of the universe and the general director of the universe and the galaxy. But why are we here this morning? Now, I know we're in church, but let's be honest. Some of you are in a recovery ministry. We all are actually in recovery. But in recovery, there is a remarkable term which you're probably familiar with. It talks about the elephant in the living room. Let's talk about the elephant in the living room <clears throat> as we look into the scripture today. As Mike shared with you, this is the Trinity Annual Meeting. It was a year ago that a great season of unpleasantness broke loose here at Trinity. And this is the anniversary of that date. And you, as faithful followers of Christ, you have gone through a great deal of pain and turmoil. And the book of Philippians speaks to you, to me, and to us in the light of that particular context. But I want to ask you a question. <clears throat> Who was the first Christian that you remember? How did that person share faith with you? Did it take? Why or why not? As I just shared with you, I was raised, uh, I'm an Oregonian, I grew up, uh, my boyhood home was on the Oregon coast in the middle of nowhere, raised by a pack of wolves according to tradition. For those of you who really want to know, I grew up two and a half miles north of Yahats, Oregon, which is 20 miles south of Newport, and for the golfers, that's 95 miles north of Bandon Dunes. There in the middle of nowhere, as a motel kid, I was not raised in a Christian <clears throat> or a church tradition, but I remember vividly when a woman, a single mom with three sons, Luke, Duke, and what's his name, tried to share the gospel with me. Luke and Duke spent a lot of time at our house because they lived in a hovel with only electricity, no running water, do the math, about 15 by 20 feet. And this little lady from a Nazarene church shared, tried to share Jesus with me. It didn't take, but in time, it did. Contrast that with my wife's background, and we've been married almost 49 years. No, we've been married 49 years. I can't say almost. We've done. More on that one later. Now, we got married when we were 11. You need to remember that. 
So, <clears throat> my wife comes from a centuries-old godly tradition. Her great-great-grandfather was the founder of a particular denomination in the United States that came out of the Ukraine and southern Russia. My wife has come from this godly tradition, and she married me, the Englishman, the heathen kid. Now, all marriage is cross-cultural. Some is a little more cross-cultural than others. But who shared Christ with you? Did it take? What was that about? How did the seeds of faith begin to play into your life so that you, in time, came to Christ? Now, I talked about my boyhood home. From uh, the podium here to the Pacific Ocean to the big water was about 50 to 55 yards from our back window. I was a motel kid. My folks owned the motel, but I was a motel kid. And the beach was my playground. But from the time I was a boy, I was captivated by the power of the Pacific. Up from Yahats, from our motel, from Wayside Lodge, about two and a half miles, there was an area called Big Stump Beach. And there, out in the middle of the beach, was this gigantic stump. Later I learned it was a Sitka spruce. And nobody thought anything about it, except where did it come from? Why is that out there? Till in the last 20 to 25 years, <clears throat> the, um, you're going to learn your new big word of the day, the paleoseismologists. Okay, class, say it with me. Paleoseismologists began to understand about the Cascadia fault line. And perhaps uh, you just happened to look at the New Yorker magazine or clip that came in yesterday with tomorrow's date on it, and here's the name of it. The really big one. An earthquake will destroy a sizable proportion of the coastal northwest. The question is when. The uptake says the earthquake that will devastate Seattle. And this particular article talks about this remarkable phenomena of power that back in 1700 unleashed a 600-mile wave that hit Asia. And they can time it to the hour. Power. As I began junior high, my folks moved back to suburban Portland. And there, on a clear day in Portland, Okay, 12 a year, what can I say? I could look down Stark Street and see Mount Hood perfectly framed by the telephone poles, but if I walked a couple of blocks away, I could look across into the state of Washington and see the beautiful Sugarloaf Mountain, Mount St. Helens, until one Sunday morning, May 18th, 1980, an enormous power was unleashed and 1,700 feet of St. Helens was blown across the state of Washington, Montana, Canada, and literally around the world. Enormous power. Those of us here in Southern California in what is euph euphemistically called a seismically active zone, my wife and I were taking a few days at a friend's condo down in the lower desert, Palm Springs, Palm Desert, somewhere in there, our daughter was up, our youngest daughter was up at Pine Summit uh, at a summer camp. And this one Sunday morning, I was scheduled to come in to preach at a church in La Puente, a church in transition. And suddenly, I thought, I don't remember going to sleep on a waterbed. Waterbed. I've never been on a, this is an earthquake. I was vertically erect in a nanosecond, I reached for the TV of our friends, didn't want that to go splat. And some of you remember that day, <clears throat> the Landers quake, 7.1. But about five hours, four hours later, came the Big Bear quake, 6.9. And it was like a thunderclap. That Sunday, as I drove up out of the low desert on 10, Mount San Gorgonio was completely occluded by a dust cloud of over 10,000 feet. Some of you remember that day as if it was yesterday. Why? Because of the unleashing of power. Now, if you have your New Testaments, I'd like you to join with me in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. 
And it's not the church letter to the Philippines, and if you put that in your Google browser, it will probably correct you. So, I believe that the center point, that the central argument of the book of Philippians revolves around verse 27. But I want you to read it. I want you to listen as I read and make some comments. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then when I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you, note the military language, that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one person for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Paul, even as we shared at the communion service, the centrality of the cross of Jesus Christ, when Christ cried out on the cross to telestai, it is finished. This is about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that gospel that had the power and has the power to save us and to empower us as Christ followers who make up his church. Whatever happens, my observation is there's a lot of whatever that's happening. So one of my African-American pastor friends says from the South Bay, hey, life happens. Life, life happens. Paul, <clears throat> from my way of thinking, and you have to give me some indulgence for my Irish uh, perverted humor, Paul had a four-digit IQ. In other words, he was a really bright guy. Really, really bright. World-class bright, or the world-class education that goes with it. And Paul did not have to take the Harvard Vocabulary Building class. And in his vocabulary, he chose a unique and unusual word for citizenship. We, we call it con conduct here, conduct yourselves. It means to live out our lives as citizens of the kingdom of God with all the privileges and responsibilities that thereto appertain. Some of you in your mind have gone to uh, Philippians chapter 3 and say, does this relate? Where Paul says, uh, chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Same concept, different word. Paul is playing on the fact that Philippi was a Roman colony. And a Roman colony carried with it great prestige, but huge privileges and responsibilities. And he's tying into the fact that they are dual citizens not only of Rome, but they are citizens of the kingdom of God, the upper story. And as citizens of the kingdom of God, they are to represent the king and the kingdom. And we as Christ followers, and I know that some of you are still grappling with who Jesus is, and if you're going to commit your life to him, I understand that. But for those of us who have committed our lives to Christ, we as Christ followers are part of the kingdom of God. You may have noticed on the four o'clock, the five o'clock, the six o'clock, the nine o'clock, the 10 o'clock, and the 11 o'clock news that we are in a pre-election year. Did you get the memo? And everything is kind of being preheated. As I think about citizenship and what we're already assaulted with from every angle, it is beyond my comprehension. Now, having said that, we are first citizens of the kingdom of God and secondarily of the United States or perhaps a country of which you are still a citizen. 
Paul says we are to live out our life as kingdom citizens to make Christ look good in all that we do individually as well as collectively as the body of Christ. Well, that's all well and good, but how in the world is this going to happen? This gets back to power. Perhaps you'll need to turn a page in your Bibles, and I'm going to read a few verses with some commentary, and I want you to think about that chorus that is sometimes sung, this is the air we breathe. Or perhaps you've heard uh, Billy Graham's daughter, Ann Graham Lotz, uh, repeat, just give me Jesus. Listen to the Apostle Paul. Uh, I'm going to go back to verse 4. If anyone thinks he or she has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have far more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, blah, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, regarded the law, Pharisee. Oh, as for zeal, persecuting the church, Paul never forgot that he had whacked human beings, that he was responsible for taking human life. But look at verse 7. But whatever was to my profit, I count and consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I lost all things, I consider them rubbish. Pause. Hit pause on your DVR. The word rubbish <clears throat> is the most sanitized translation in the entire scripture. Dave would have to call the elders of the church if I translated how this really is. Your mother would have washed my mouth out with soap. This word is so vile that it cannot be easily translated into English. That is what Paul was comparing his past life to and his righteousness before Jesus Christ. I count it but rubbish. Why? That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Verse 10, I want to know Christ. Notice the key of how this ties back to verse 8, knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. But here he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. For years, I'm a little slow, remember that. How does Paul, with his four-digit IQ and this vocabulary, why does he want to know Christ? When I was a student at what is now Biola University, <clears throat> I was a fairly young Christian. Some people think I still am. But that's another story. And I would have some of my classmates, <clears throat> and I, in today's language, I, would, I frankly wondered, what in the world are they smoking? where they'd stand up and get all holy and say, oh, I just want to know Christ. I didn't get it until one day I came to understand what the word know means here. Know means not a cognitive knowledge. It means a knowledge of the heart and a relational knowledge of experience, something that is tied to life and that is not theoretical. Paul says, this is my passion to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Now, Dave, as you know, anytime you involve an audience in a church, you're on touchy ground. But church, we're going to have a little theological question here. When you embrace Christ, when you came to faith in Jesus Christ, who came to indwell you? God the Holy Spirit. Very good class. Very few dissenters. Very few. So if God, the Holy Spirit, came to indwell us, watch with me. 
I can make a very good biblical case that we do not have time for today that the primary agent of the Trinity, of the Godhead, was God the Holy Spirit raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The one who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the transcendent moment of history, he is the one who indwells us. He is the power of the resurrection. Now, to conduct our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel, it is going to take the power of God, the power of the resurrected Jesus, God the Holy Spirit, to allow us to live our lives with this kind of citizenship responsibility with the privileges that come our way. That's nice. So how in the world does this work? We're going to get to some principles that I believe are what I call core biblical principles, not four steps to a happier life or four steps to the spirit-controlled life, but part of a core commitment that we make individually and together in our walk with Christ as we follow him. And as we follow Jesus Christ, and he said, come, follow me. As we follow Christ, we are heading in the right direction. We get there in his time, and as we follow Christ, as it says in Corinthians, we are changed from glory to glory in that transforming power of Jesus Christ. So our proper conduct, the power of the Spirit, and then is there a way that we can get there? We all need retrofitting. <clears throat> uh, on the drive out, I live in Cyprus, uh, to the office at 62.7 miles. And if it's to the back of the parking lot, it is 63 miles on the thing. And on Sunday morning, may I share with you that traffic flows nicely. No confessions today. <clears throat> There's a lot of retrofitting that I saw this morning. There's a bridge near my house. It's actually the 22 as it goes across Knott Avenue. And I watched for three years as our friends at Caltrans worked on retrofitting this bridge. It was a massive undertaking. Why? To gird us up so that in a seismically after active area, if a big one comes, we won't be smashed. But what are some of these privileges and responsibilities that I and we need to follow? In your notes, for those of you who like to do some fill-ins, here they are. Number one, there is a performance trap, and I have to make a particular declaration. And going back into chapter 3, verse 12 and 13, that unpacks this because Paul says, I have not been made perfect yet. He says, I haven't arrived. My passion is to conduct my life in a manner worthy of the gospel. I want to know Christ experientially and the power of the resurrection, God the Holy Spirit within me. But he's having to remind the church at Philippi that he loves so much that he had not arrived. Now, as good biblical evangelical Christians, we don't believe in mantras or mantras, depending on which side of the Mississippi you came from. But I'm going to suggest one. The scripture is clear. There is no perfect church. There is no perfect pastor. There is no perfect pastor next. There is no perfect search process. There's no perfect transitional senior pastor. There's no perfect board. There's no perfect staff. There is no perfect parishioner who's a Christ follower. We are in process together. And I believe that one of the vilest heresies has been the performance <clears throat> factor of how we have swallowed the Kool-Aid of believing if we get robo-pastor, then we become the bionic church filled with bionic Christians who can make the great difference. God uses people like you and people like me. And if you're hung up on the perfection thing, may I share the word from my now 36-year-old daughter when she was 13? Dad, get over it. 
The biblical premise, we face and focus these facts together, and I have to face up to the fact that no one is perfect. There is a second trap, and that is the past or the nostalgia trap, and it looks like this. I forget what went on before. I have to choose to live. I have to make a decision. We face the future together, and we choose to live with our backs to the past. Two quick illustrations. <clears throat> One of my friends, John, who possibly some of you would know because of his Campus Crusade background, <clears throat> some of you remember fax machines. One day I get a fax from John, and it's a story about a survivor on a South Sea island. And a ship saw the island and the smoke, and they came ashore, and the captain came over in a rowboat, and this guy was so excited to finally know that freedom was coming. And the guy excitedly led him around and showed him his house. And then he said, and he had three huts there. And this one hut, he said, and this is where I go to church. And the captain said, well, what are these other two huts? He said, huh, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> Second story. Like some of you, I get a great deal of my theological input by rereading uh, Charles Schultz's classic Peanuts. And usually in July, Schultz would weave the gospel in sometime or another, as he often did. But we've just gone past the all-star game, <clears throat> and I was thinking about this great one where Charlie's on the mound, Lucy's out in right field where she belongs, and the batter hits, the ball comes, and Charlie's on the mound saying, I think she's going to catch it this year. I think she's going to catch it this year. Ball comes, plop, 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 plop. They meet for the obligatory meeting out behind second base. Now listen, Charlie said, Lucy, I thought you were going to catch it this year. This is what Lucy said. So did I but the past got in my eyes. So did I, but the past got in my eyes. The business of forgetting is a process. And this is something that we could spend weeks on. Forgetting what is behind. And I'm straining toward what is ahead. And I am pressing forward for the glory of Jesus Christ. There's a third thing, old word, Pollyanna trap, that has to do with direction. I'm not going to do anything other than say this. Paul is using military language to talk about a massive change of direction that must be your decision as well as mine, and it's one that comes on a regular basis. The last thing here that I have is the passive trap, and this is something that I have to choose day by day by day, like the Apostle Paul did, that I am going to be in the process of forgetting. I am going to be like a track athlete straining toward the finish line. I am going to be one that is pressing ahead and through obstacles because I need, we need to fulfill our focus together so therefore, we give life everything we've got. My wife and I, as I said, we've just celebrated our 49th anniversary, and Dave and Marilyn celebrate their 50th anniversary. I believe it's next month in August. <clears throat> 50 years with Dave. Send her a card. <laughs> just saying, just saying. When we were married <clears throat> on that hot day in Lodi, stuck in Lodi again for you music lovers, from Creedence Clearwater Revival. Uh, <clears throat> the Bible was open, and our life verse was Psalm 34, 3. Come glorify and exalt the Lord with me. We're going to do this together. And there we prayed and committed our lives to Christ as a married couple. And we committed ourselves to falling in love afresh every day. If I told you that we had succeeded, what would you call me? Very good class, excellent, all right. 
absolutely a liar, but that was our commitment to follow Christ together. Even it was Paul was energized and empowered by resurrection power, his passion for Jesus, his purpose of the vision and the mission, the power to do this, to conduct himself and the church of Jesus Christ in a manner that makes Jesus look good by the power of the resurrection and owning up to the fact that I've got stuff to take care of on a daily basis. Last week as I was among you, <clears throat> I truly experienced the fact that even in the middle of July, the life of God is in this place. I experienced a spirit of worship in all three services that ministered to my soul and said, Baker, God isn't finished with Trinity because there is a commitment to Jesus that is here. And as we walk together, God will honor that. Last story. My former next door neighbor now moved to Reno. Bill's eight years older than I am. Retired colonel, 28 and a half years in the Army, Army Airborne Ranger Beret. One of the first 1,500 officially into Vietnam, three tours of duty. Bill loves Jesus. Bill also has a colorful command of the English language that is simply transcendent. But one day this email shows up from Bill, a statement of his faith. I want to share it with you as we close. One Sunday morning, an old cowboy entered a church just before services were to begin. Although the old man and his clothes were spotlessly clean, he wore jeans, a denim shirt, and boots that were very worn and ragged. In his hand, he carried a worn-out old hat and an equally worn-out old Bible. The church he entered into was in a very upscale and exclusive part of the city. It was the largest and most beautiful church the old cowboy had ever seen. The people in the congregation were all dressed in expensive clothes and accessories. As the cowboy took a seat, others moved away from him. No one greeted him or welcomed him or spoke to him. They were appalled at his appearance and did not attempt to hide it. As the old cowboy was leaving the church, the preacher approached him and asked the cowboy to do him a favor. Before you come back to here again, would you have a talk with God and ask him what he thinks would be the appropriate attire for worship? The old cowboy assured the preacher that he would. Well, the next Sunday, the old cowboy showed back up again wearing the same ragged jeans, shirt, boots, and hat. And once again, he was completely shunned and ignored. The preacher approached the man and said, I thought I asked you to talk to God before you came back to our church. I did, replied the old cowboy. Well, if you spoke to God, what did he tell you was the proper attire that should be worn for worshiping here? Well, sir, God told me he didn't have a clue what I should wear. He said he'd never been in this church before. Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives. We thank you that as we follow you, our best days as a Christ follower and as a church, and particularly Trinity Church, are yet ahead. And long, Lord, we long for that kind of kingdom impact. We want the life of God to be evident and visible, that we are the kind of people who make a difference in where we are. So Lord, again this morning, we choose a fresh to dial in to that resurrection power that we might honor you in a way that makes you look good in all that we do. So Lord, hear our prayer, and Lord, bless this church as they follow you. And this I pray on our behalf, in Christ's name, amen.